Well, the new Intel CPUs, formerly codename Arrow Lake, are out. That brings a new motherboard, though. And so if you're going to upgrade to this platform, you're going to need a new motherboard and a new CPU. And probably new cooling, although power efficiency is one of the big improvements this generation. Now, I've taken a look on Linux at the Core Ultra 5 and the Core Ultra 9 to see how they stack up. And it turns out that these CPUs may actually be better as Linux workstation CPUs than Windows, at least right now in 2024. If you're interested in Windows, you can check out my other Windows review, 24H2, maybe 24H2, 2152, which is the Insider build, which does have some small improvements for this CPU. But this is a mixed performance and efficiency core platform. The Core Ultra 9 is 16 efficiency cores and 8 performance cores. This Core Ultra 5 platform is 5 performance cores and 8 efficiency cores. But I'm surprised at how well Linux works with these CPUs. Maybe it's scheduler, maybe it's kernel enablement. I am running 6.11 for my kernel. It's pretty awesome for basically everything except gaming. And gaming is not bad. It's just that gaming is not better than the previous generation. Let's take a closer look. So the headline features that Intel is bringing are their new SkyMont cores. They're up, I mean, these E cores are far and away better than E cores of previous generations. They're better than the E cores in pretty much every other Intel product. They're gonna pave the way for more updated, more, more better E cores and, and other products. An AI NPU, so yes, this is a desktop processor, but it has an NPU. It's got XE2 graphics, which is already got pretty good Linux enablement. Uh, and we've also got a really interesting block diagram where they're spreading the P cores out on the silicon. It's probably for heat and power distribution related reasons, but hey, I'll take it. This is also a fully tile-based CPU, meaning that Intel is taking little tiles of silicon, bending them individually, and then fusing those all together with their Foveros technology into one CPU. And this is the first time that Intel has ever done this in a desktop CPU, and this really is the future. That has a lot of trade-offs, though. The big one is memory latency, and for gamers, memory latency and other platform latency, like the, the internal uh, bus in, in the processor and the interconnects and everything like that, benefit from being just a monolithic piece of silicon. The problem is that it's not economic to put all of this in one single monolithic piece of silicon. You actually want to have the smallest piece of silicon possible to increase yields and then take all of the best silicon and stitch it together and then boom, you've got your Core Ultra 9 or the perhaps slightly less amazing silicon and stitch that together and boom, your Core Ultra 5. This Core Ultra 5 is no slouch though. I mean, it can still go 5 gigahertz plus, even a little bit more with an overclock. And the Linux performance is really interesting. Now for vaguely workstation, like enthusiast developer workstation type workloads, it really is about 12 to 16% faster for developer workloads, specifically on Linux. Code compile, uh, WebAssembly, believe it or not, if you want to break it out into a WebAssembly benchmark, it's actually very fast. But curiously, running WebExpert, which is kind of a comprehensive top-down, we're going to automate the browser and do stuff in the browser and have stuff in the browser uh, be benchmarked and then look at how much time it took to do those tasks in a browser, uh, is worse. It is uh, actually worse than 14th gen. Uh, but the actual WebAssembly benchmark from the command line, like I'm just going to run WebAssembly and translate it into machine code, that's faster than 14th gen by kind of a wide margin. And that was a very baffling result and suggests that there's some unoptimization here at work that is annoying. Now, a lot of people are going to jump on and say, oh, it's scheduler related and uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, no, well, not on Linux. I mean, maybe to an extent. The only truth, the tiniest nugget of truth in that is game mode run. Game mode run for running games on Linux through Steam that automatically helps with moving processes around and running games optimally um, may need some adjustments for Arrow Lake. But generally, Linux does the right thing. And the physical layout of the cores, where the P cores are distributed all over the compute tile, that's actually pretty good. Uh, LS topology, I've got you know some cores that are bolded. It doesn't. It knows. It knows they each have their own individual three megs of L2 cache. It knows that there's a shared 24 megs of L3 cache. It knows that the E core clusters have four megs of shared L2 cache. 
it knows. The operating system knows. It doesn't, the physical topology of this doesn't actually matter, which is amazing and good and speaks volumes about proper operating system design. And so a lot of games do actually work correctly on Linux. The bottleneck is mostly down to like the internal fabric and the internal tile interconnect speeds as far as I can tell. Uh, this is an ASRock Steel Legend motherboard that we're using uh, for this particular video. I've also got uh, more motherboard reviews coming up from both MSI and ASUS. And the reason that I picked the Steel Legend is because Arrow Lake actually does have error correction support. So this is an ECC UDIM, a 48 gig ECC UDIM. And when I put this in the system, it is actually detected as an 80 bit wide DIM instead of 64 bits wide. Intel submitted patches to the Linux kernel 6.11, I believe, at the last minute to get EDAC enabled on Arrow Lake S, which is a slightly different platform than this. Theoretically, maybe someone can unlock error correction support on desktop, but I wouldn't hold my breath. For now, that did not work. And even though DMI decode detected it as 80 bit wide DIMMs, um, RAS utils and uh, EDAC util, or RAS daemon and EDAC utils, and the RAS daemon control utility did not detect the uh, error correction capabilities of this platform, but perhaps detected the error correction capabilities within the CPU. Uh, and it did also seem to detect the PCIe error correction capability, which is nothing new. Intel has supported PCIe level error correction since time immemorial. Uh, you can disable that, or historically you've been able to disable that. But on this platform, it's basically okay. Uh, there are a lot of knobs and tunables in the BIOS for controlling a lot of these aspects of the CPU. Overclocking is going to be a whole new experience with these CPUs, and so there should be full, like, the overclockers are going to get into this, and they're going to have a lot of fun. It remains to be seen how much that's going to contribute to system stability. One of the other aspects of the CPU launch that is really interesting are the uh, memory timings and subtimings. Because this is a whole bunch of different pieces of silicon that all really kind of need to be in sync with one another, especially if you're chasing maximum gaming performance, you're gonna wanna run everything at specific frequencies related to the maximum stable frequency of your memory. And the memory platform here is very much improved over all other DDR5 platforms. And you also run CU DIMMs now. now CU DIMMs have an onboard clock timing facility, like there's actual hardware on there, which will clean up the signal, redriving, retiming. I don't, well, I don't want to get into the particulars of that, but just understand that the way that clocks are done on those DIMMs is different, and not every DDR5 platform is going to have compatibility with the new CU DIMMs. But I was able to get DDR5-8800 working on this platform with varying support across uh, you know, depending on what board it was. Our Steel Legend motherboard, DDR5-8000 was pretty reliable and pretty easily obtainable with our ADATA XPG memory kit. This platform also has teething issues in that some games with some anti-cheat on Windows, when they crash, it will cause a blue screen. But then immediately following the blue screen, if you do a mem memory test, I was getting memory errors. But this was happening on not just ADATA kits, but other kits of memory. Bottom line, what's the verdict? This is exactly the engineering position that Intel needs to be in. And if you're curious about more thoughts waxing poetic on that, check out the other review on the main level one text channel. Specifically in the context of Linux, this is still a really, really good CPU. I have a feeling that with changes to various Linux distributions and probably game mode run, a lot of the performance regressions from 14th gen to this generation can be resolved. Multi-core performance is already better than 14th gen generally on Linux. The AI neural processing unit, NPU, opens up a whole new world of possibilities, but on Linux, there's not really software there yet that will use that. It's really hard to recommend this CPU if you have alternatives that tick the boxes a little bit better for whatever it is that you're looking for. The Z890 platform itself is probably one of the best features of this CPU launch. You have more Gen 5 PCIe lanes, more, uh, it's possible for motherboard makers to implement more high speed 10 gigabit and beyond USB ports. You, it's possible for motherboard, desktop motherboard makers to implement more X4 slots, PCIe Gen 4. This platform paves the way for a second generation Intel processor where they've really figured out the formula for tiles and mixing and matching the capabilities of individual tiles. I think they'll solve their memory controller uh, rough edges in pretty short order. 
I think board makers have a very strong financial incentive to help figure out some of this stuff. But even the more uh, entry level ish boards like the Steel Legend, I mean, Steel Legend is actually like upper, upper, upper entry level. It's got a lot of really cool features. Um, even with boards like that, it's already a pretty good experience. And arguably, the Linux experience right now is better than the Windows experience in terms of performance consistency and everything else, with the one exception of gaming performance is a little bit worse if you had a 14900K or something like that. If you're on an older platform, older than Intel 11th gen, yes, this is a perfectly reasonable platform to upgrade to. I don't think you're gonna have any real significant issues. And by the time there's one or two more major kernel versions behind us, uh, a lot of these problems will probably have been solved, either, either by the newer kernel or by BIOS fixes or, or what have you. So overall, it's, it's a little bit of a rough start for Intel, but this is the right direction for Intel to go in. And I hope that the rough start with the product doesn't detract from the engineering accomplishments that have to be in place for Intel to pull this off. Our tile slash chiplet future uh, may unlock a level of manufacturing efficiency we haven't seen in a while so that we're not spending thousands upon thousands of dollars for a reasonable desktop computer at some point in the future. But for now, it's actually really fast. 5.7 gigahertz Linux. It's a pretty good uplift, multi-core. I'm one of those level one, Linux. Let's hang out in the Linux forums. Let me know what questions you have. Uh, we'll take one of these for a spin or let me know what, what you want to run. All right, I'm signing out and I'll see you there.